our adversity, our problems, and perhaps you've had some already this week. <laughs> Big ones, small ones, but we've all had some trials, haven't we? Maybe this very morning, getting your kids up and ready for church. <laughs> I had a couple mothers smile. <laughs> How did he know? We made it. <laughs> we made it. Trials, that's part of life. And uh, God, God sends them. Yes, not only allows them, but God designs them. He, uh, he's the great architect. And uh, he fashions them specifically for us. And uh, we want to know how to make the best use of them. Don't waste it. Uh, one, you make a good use of your trials when you understand that God designed them especially for you. Okay? Accidents don't happen. There's no such thing as an accident. These things come our way by the Lord's sovereign providence. He governs all things. Secondly, we make good use of our trials when it drives you to God in heartfelt prayer. When you have a problem, do you, do you fret and stew or do you go to God in prayer? God sends trials to turn us to Himself. Pray. And we looked at, we studied Psalm chapter 28. When David cried out, he, he, he sensed his need, right? And that's what trials are for. God sends trials, adversity, to drive us to our need and drive us to our knees. And when we come to our sense of a need, we cry out, Oh my rock, the Lord, oh my rock, do not be silent to me. We cry out to God, and that's exactly what He wants. Hear the voice of my supplication. That is my pleading, my begging. That's what we are. And then our prayers turn to praises, don't they? That's inevitable. Those who pray, God hears and responds, and we respond then with praises. That's always the way it is. Blessed be the Lord. The Lord is my strength and my shield. I am helped. God always helps His people. He doesn't always help the way we tell them to, uh, but God helps. God responds to the prayers of His people. Sometimes He removes the mountain. Sometimes He gives us the grace and the strength to get over it or to go around it. Uh, but, but God uh, always helps His people. And then that, uh, when God when he puts us through a trial and we cry out and he, he helps us, it always then overflows to God's people around us. Because trials aren't designed to isolate us. And I know sometimes that happens. We, we want to seclude ourselves and stay home from church and I don't want to see anybody because I'm going through this adversity. No, that's the opposite effect that God wants. God wants us to be with His people. God wants us to, to share the blessings of God with His people. It should overflow. And then not only that, but praying for God's people. And so, so David says, uh, he, he prays for God's people that the Lord is not only my strength, he says the Lord is the strength of His people, of His anointed. And, and then David not only says the Lord is the strength, he prays, Lord, save your people. Bless your inheritance. Sh shepherd them. Lift them up. Carry them in, their, in your arms like you do me. And so our concern for others, our love for others, our praying for others, that should be one of the results of, of our adversity and trials. That we turn towards others and we think about others. Third, we just started this last week. We make good use of your trial when you seek comfort from God rather than your medical odds. If you're taking comfort in the proficiency of the doctors and the medicines, you're finding comfort in the wrong thing. Yes, God has granted to them wisdom. God has used them as His tools in His hands. But that's not where our trust is in. Psalm chapter 20 says, Some trust in chariots and some trust in horses. But we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. That is where our comfort, our security, our hope, our, 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 our peace comes from, is from trusting in God. Some people take comfort or fear in the stage of the cancer. Well, it's only a stage three. Well, it's only stage two. We got seventy-five percent chance of being healed, and they take comfort in the stage or the prognosis. No. 
Some take comfort in the assessment of this situation, that they've been able to devise a course for survival. They take comfort in having a plan to weather the storm. They've met with the arbitrator at work. They've met with the loan officer. They've met with um, the uh, loan consolidation officer. Uh, they've met with uh, a marriage counselor. And they got a plan together. Now, I feel better that we can handle this. I can handle this now. And so their comfort comes in that plan. No. That's not the purpose that God sends trials so that we take comfort in other people or in a plan. Our comfort is supposed to be found in God Himself. Some people take comfort in the fact that they've got it all figured out now. I took a course in crisis management. I can weather anything. I've, uh, I've done counseling and I, I know how to deal with people now and I'll, I'll solve this problem because I got it all under control. That's not God's purpose in sending that trial. I wrote to dear Abby. Got it all now. I feel better about the situation. No. Our comfort and our hope and our security in a time of trial needs to come from God and God alone. Amen. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthians. He planned to go to Corinth for about three years. He's been delayed. It was a pretty serious delay. Starting off in verse 3, beginning of chapter 1, verse 3, Paul says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort." who comforts us in all our tribulation. Oh, well, it was nice when he was talking about God of mercy and God of all comfort, but now he's bringing in the tribulation part. And we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings, you notice the words he's usually using now? The tribulation, the trouble, verse 5, the sufferings of Christ abound in us. That's right. You know, in fact, Christians suffer more than unbelievers. You know that? We're not only in a spiritual battle. <laughs> Satan doesn't mind unbelievers, but he especially attacks and demons attack Christians. The world is against us. The world hates Christians. Persecution from the world just because we're Christians. It comes in all forms. <laughs> Not to mention all the other forms of suffering. Christians suffer more than others. And these sufferings abound in us. So our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now if we are afflicted, oh, there's another word, afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we're comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia. <laughs> so now Paul's going to talk about these sufferings, trials, afflictions, the problems that he's had that's delayed him for three years. And by the way, I don't think this was even mentioned in the in, in book of Acts, which is a history. It mentions a lot of the things that happened to Paul, the shipwreck and the beatings and stonings and left for dead and chased here and there and uh, uh, thrown in prison. This isn't even mentioned in Acts. This trial, afflict. but it was something pretty severe that it delayed him for three years in getting to Corinth. And he says here in verse 8, we don't want you to be ignorant of what happened to us. <coughs> Our trouble. Notice what he says about his trouble. We were burdened beyond measure. All right? Pressed out of measure. The King James says. Uh, what does it say here? Burdened beyond measure. Utterly burdened. That word there, uh, it, it's a word which actually means that uh, it, it's beyond our abilities. It, it, it just uh, pushed beyond our limits, way down more than we can handle. 
Um, that's not me in the car there. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a all for do-it-yourselfers, but that's what the word actually means. And it's the Greek word hyperbole, from which we get our word hyperbole. Literally means to throw beyond. Beyond anything you can do, beyond anything you can imagine. We are pressed beyond ourselves. That's what the word means. Utterly burdened beyond our ability to bear up. That's where the word hyperbole came from. And then the next phrase, he said, so, so we were burdened beyond measure. And then it says above strength. Above strength. Again, he's using the word hooper. <laughs> uh, above and beyond dunamis. Above our strength, our power, our ability. Humanly, Paul says, it was beyond us. We were utterly burdened, beyond what you could imagine, beyond our ability, above our strength, above and beyond anything we could possibly handle. Now, I take it that the fact you're all here this morning, you haven't gotten to that point yet. But that's what Paul was suffering, along with Timothy and Sylvanus. They kept them for three years. They were going through something pretty tragic. Not only that, he says this, we despaired of life itself. Despaired of life itself. The word despair even is kind of a neat word. Uh, um, come, we, get, we get our word porous, non-porous, uh, not, not something's porous, water can go through, right? Uh, something that's non-porous can't get through. And this is the word ek, uh, aphorus, uh, from, it's, it, it's not able, there's no passage through it, that's what it means. You can't get through it. And that's what he was saying here. He despaired of life. There was no way through. There's no escape route. As far as human calculating, we were in stage 10. <laughs> it, beyond any hope, 100% were dead. We're goners. We're finished. There's no way out. There's no escape route. There's no passage through. That's pretty severe. That's what Paul says. We despaired of life itself. We're dead men. When we wake up tomorrow morning, we'll be dead. Of course, you didn't get that because you had to wake up. Me. <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, despair that there was absolutely no way, no hope. What else does he say? Verse 9, yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. Yeah. God has written us off. We're done. We are, in our opinion, the odds. It's 100% certain we're dead. We cannot survive. We cannot make it. It's the end. We have received God's death sentence. Think about this. The Apostle Paul. Busy, faithfully serving the Lord. Doing what God has called them to do. Preaching, faithfully establishing churches. Preaching the Gospel. And yet God brought this kind of adversity into their life. And it wasn't short term. This is going on two, three years now. That they're struggling with this. Seemingly being cut off from being able to do what God had called them to do. You know, David struggled with the same thing, didn't he? I used to go with the people of God to the temple. And now I'm in exile, I can't. And he cries out, God, why do you allow this to happen? I, I want to serve you, I want to be there worshiping you at the temple with the people of God. The exiled Jews, same thing. They were going through adversity and problems and seemingly prevented from doing what God had wanted them to do. So it's not just the trial or the adversity that's so severe. It's that he's being cut off seemingly from doing what God would have him do. Why? 
Well, the scriptures actually tell us why. They don't always. Appreciated that in Gary's class this morning. We're going to go back to that in a little while. God always doesn't tell us why. Sometimes he does. Notice the next phrase. Verse 9. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. That. That, that there means so that or because. So that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. God brings these adversities and severe adversities at times to knock out all the human props, people, programs, friends, counselors, loan officers, 401ks. He knocks all the props out so that our trust, our hope, our security is in Him alone. He brings cancer. Can you handle cancer? No. It's beyond us. Well, who do you turn to? Who do you trust? The doctors? No. Our trust is in God and God alone. That's not to mean we refuse medical treatment. That would be presuming upon God. That would be foolishness. God has given that as a tool. You don't sit there and say, uh, God, get, you know, nourish me and give me strength for my body and then refuse to eat. You don't say, God, I'm trusting you're going to keep my body well nourished and hydrated. I'm going to refuse to drink. Nor do we refuse medical treatment, what God has given us and common sense to use. But our hope, our trust is not in that. It's in God. In fact, let's take our, bi our, hymn, our Bibles, our hymn books, and just turn over to that song, Be Still My Soul. It's, uh, it's let's see, what number is that? 290. Yes, 290. Thank you, Amy. 290, Be Still My Soul. Catherine von Schlegel, back in 1600, 1700, maybe something, wrote this song, Be Still My Soul. The Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. You know what? She understood that the, uh, the chances of us suffering are 100%. If you want to calculate the odds, our chances of suffering are 100%. You will have tribulation in the world, Jesus said, John chapter 16. But when you read this, your hope, your consolation, nothing shake. He, he's, the, he's our guide, the future as he has the past. Uh, verse 2, thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. Verse 3, the hour is hastening on when we shall be forever with the Lord. When disappointment, grief, and fear are gone. That's what we suffer now in this life, but soon they'll be gone. Sorrow forgot, love's purest joys restored. Yeah, we have 100% guarantee of suffering and trials and adversity in this life, but we also have 100% guarantee that the Lord is on our side Amen. and that he's going to see us through to glory. Amen. That uh, him, uh, how great, a, uh, how firm a foundation, which is number 268, I have you turn there too, 268. Again, the, uh, the odds... Uh, uh, Again, a hundred percent guarantee you're going to have some trials and adversities. Verse two: Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my gracious, omnipotent hand. When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of woe shall not the overflow. For I will be with thee, thy troubles to bless, and sanctify to thee thy deepest. Distress. In other words, God's going to use these to sanctify His people. God uses these trials, these storms of life to try our faith, to bring us forth as gold, to better us. When through, verse 4, when through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be your supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. 
The soul that on Jesus has leaned for repose. I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no never, no never forsake. Those are great words, aren't they? The guarantee is 100%. That is if you're computing the odds. <laughs> Some people like to hear odds from the doctors. Well, I got a 70% chance of uh, survival. I'd rather go with the, the odds that the scripture gives. You have a 100% guarantee of going through trials. And you got a 100% guarantee certainty that God will be there with you. And use those trials in your life for good. He works all things after the counsel of his own will. He works all things after his own good pleasure. He works all things for the good of his people. He works all things well, Mark tells us. Odds are. You know, when, when well, let me just back up. When you were hearing the odds, when the doctor said that cancer is stage one, maybe two, then it was two, maybe three, then it was three, now it's four. God doesn't care about the odds or the stages. They're kind of like <clears throat> the weatherman's odds for the day. You know how reliable they are. <laughs> Medical odds are based on hundreds of thousands of people that have had that cancer, stage three or stage four, and the rate of survival. But that's made up of those hundreds of thousands of people, and there were some of those people that died the next day. Zero percent. And there were some that are still alive after 38 years. They're at 100 percent. And then all those other people mixed in between. So you know what? You're not that odds. You're one individual in the hand of God in there. And the day when he's going to bring you home to glory is, is already written in his book. You don't fit, oh, I got a 75% chance of living 20 more. You're God's child in his hands and you're going to live as long as he wants you to live. Maybe it's a week, maybe it's another 25 years. We don't go by those odds. We don't go by stages. Our comfort is in God, Amen. our Lord and Savior. Fourth, you make good use of your trials when you learn the lesson of Job. The book of Job makes sense to us because we've read it. And God has given us information, um, the details from the very beginning. We know from reading the scriptures, one, we, not, we know the outcome. But, but we even know more than that. We know behind the scenes what took place. We know that it was God who said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? We know that Satan was manipulating Job himself and would have done his, killed him if he could. But God is in control and allows Satan only to do so much. We know that Job's friends were also in the dark but they had jumped to some conclusions and that they were wrong. Job was in the dark. He's bewildered. He's falsely accused by his friends. He doesn't understand what God is doing. See, we make the assumption that Job knew. Job didn't know. And if you were to put yourself in Job's place in the story, you'd understand why he was bewildered and Frustrated at times. Well, we, you would know why the friends were thinking what they were thinking. But you see, we don't. We assume, because we read it from our perspective, having all this understanding. And then we assume that Job finally came around to God's point of view because God explained it to him. You know what, though? God never explained it to Job. Never explained why he was suffering. As far as Job knew, if you were Job in the story, the only thing Job knew was that he was a righteous man. He was a man who trusted in God, who was living for God, and he was living under the blessing of God with family and friends and flocks and possessions. And he was, he was living faithfully for God and blessed of God, and then all of a sudden, 
It was gone. Family dies. Fire, earthquake, famine. Flocks destroyed. His health gone. Boils. Everything. Not only gone, but it seemed to be replaced by the judgment of God. The most severe judgment on a human being, a possible seemingly. And God never explained why. What God did is reveals Himself. And you read chapter 38 and 39 after, after 37 chapters of struggling of why, why, why. God appears to him in a whirlwind and speaks, not appears, but speaks to him out of this whirlwind. And he says, Job, do you know who I am? Job didn't really know who he was. And in this revelation, chapters 38 and 39, Job comes to understand God in His infinite greatness. Job began to realize that God is infinitely more great, grand, powerful, majestic, supreme, sovereign than anything I could have ever imagined. And me, Job says, I am little peanut of nothing. Infinitely less than I thought I was. <laughs> and he repented in sackcloth and ashes. Turn over to Job. For a minute. Job chapter 40. I'm sorry, Job chapter 42. A couple page, pages over. <coughs> I hope if I'm in Job and not in Psalms. <laughs> Job chapter 42. Notice that we'll just read the first six verses. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Now I know that you can do everything. And that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. What is that? That's a great acknowledgement that God, you are sovereign. Because, you know, chapters 38 and 39, how God revealed himself? He said, Job, Job, do you feed the squirrels? Do you take care of them? Do you make the the breeding habits, and the matching the nature of the animals with the habitats? Do you keep this world going? Do you oversee the breeding and the feeding of all the animals of this world? Do you control the fish of the sea, the stars of heaven? Do you do any of that, no, uh, uh, Job? And Job realized this whole creation, the whole universe, is under the sovereign control of God. No, it's, he didn't just create it and let it go. God actively governs sustains, holds this world together. That's right. Every animal, every bird, every egg that hatches is under God's control. And that's when Job says that you do everything. Not one intention or purpose of yours ever goes undone. You are in control, Lord. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Job says, I was speaking out of ignorance. When I questioned what you were doing, Lord, when I questioned why, why, Lord, why me? Sorry, God, that was total ignorance on my part. You... <laughs> You do what's right, Lord. I'm sorry. You can do it all. I uttered what I did not understand. Verse 4, listen please and let me speak. You said I will question you and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. So God reveals Himself but you know what he didn't do? He never explained to Job what he did or why he did it. No explanation necessary. Why? Because God wants us to trust Him. 
Our comfort and peace come from Him, not an explanation, not an understanding, not a comprehension. Simply, trust me, God says. I've got this. Okay? I don't have to know why. I don't have to be able to explain it to myself or to anybody else. I'm going through this terrible adversity. People hate me. I'm dying of this disease. It doesn't matter what the trouble is. I, I, I've gone broke. I'm financially wiped out. People have betrayed me. I don't know what the adversity is. I just know that God is bringing me through it for purposes beyond my comprehension and I don't care. I trust Him. That's what he wants. Job never knew why. God just says, here I am. This is who I am. Trust me. The whole thing is a faith issue, isn't it? This is the essence of true faith. People will say all the time, oh, I'm a believer. Yeah, what are you a believer in? You believe you said a prayer and you're a Christian? That's the extent of some people's belief. No, if we're going to be a believer, we believe God. We trust God every day. Whatever I'm going through. Okay, Lord. It's fine. Because when we doubt it, when we're saying, why, why, why me? We're doubting who He is. We're doubting His infinite wisdom. We're doubting His sovereign control. We're doubting His ability. We're doubting His care of us. We're doubting His love of us. We're doubting He really knows what's happening to us. That's doubt. That's not faith. Faith says, okay. It's okay. You, you are so infinitely great, loving, wise, powerful, whatever. I'm good. I'm good with the Lord. That's faith. No explanation. Go over to Isaiah chapter 26. It's a familiar verse, but sometimes we forget how important this is. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3 and 4. <coughs> Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep him in perfect peace. Perfect peace. 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 Shalom, shalom. It is God, Yahweh, will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For in Yah, that is Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord is everlasting strength. He's the rock of ages. Trust in the Lord. Not only forever. Let me say, trust in the Lord always and forever. Every little trial you have, do you just turn to God and pray? Okay. You're my strength. You're my shield. You're my helper. Grace to get through. Wisdom to deal with it. Whether I understand or why or whenever. Or not, I don't care, Lord. You're good. Your grace is sufficient. That's where perfect peace comes from. That's where our comfort comes from, is true <laughs> trusting in Him. Not, not in the explanation. Not in the reason why. Not in the hoped outcome or purpose. Simply trusting Him. You will keep Him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because He trusts you. <coughs> The lesson of Job, our trust, our peace, our consolation, our comfort, what we're going to call it, are in God, not in an explanation or an understanding of why. When the adversity comes, I encourage you, to just trust. I say that it's not easy, but that is the essence of faith. One of the most often quoted scriptures from the Old Testament and the New Testament is the phrase, the just shall live by faith. The just, that is the righteous person, God's child, a true Christian, the just, the just person will live by faith. Every day they just keep trusting their Lord. 
Oh, the storm clouds gather, the harsh winds blow, seemingly overwhelm, the death sentence is upon you, beyond anything humanly capable of bearing up under, no way out, no explanation, it doesn't matter. It's God in whom is my trust. You make good use of your trials when you use it to bear witness to the truth, goodness, and glory of the Lord. I'll let you ponder on that for a few weeks. We'll come back to it. I hope you use your adversities for the glory of God. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the illustration of Job and Paul who went through adversity and trials far beyond anything that we've been called to go through at this point. And yet uh, their trust was in you. You knocked out uh, their hope in anything else, humanly. No government to help. No people to help. No program to help. They just trusted in you. And our prayer, Lord, is that that's where our faith would be found. In you and you alone. Not. And so we, we wouldn't dare ask for trials, Lord. But we do ask that when you bring these trials, that we would respond properly. And that our faith would be strong in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hymn number 267. 267. All things work together for good. Take it from Romans chapter 8. Let's stand as we sing, please. On the first verse, all things work out for good, we know such is God's great design. He orders all our steps below for purposes divine. For purposes divine.